Okay, here I have my basic server. And this server is got a static IP address of 172.20.1.1 with a 16-bit uh, mask. So that's a 172.20.1.1 with a mask of 255.255.0.0. And you don't necessarily need a default gateway, but it's helpful. And then I set DNS to use my local server. Um, I also want to point out that if I take a look at my server manager, I see that I have the roles installed for Active Directory, which you're going to need. DHCP and DNS. So DNS automatically installs the forward lookup zone for the LAN WAN domain, which is our Active Directory. And under DHCP, I have IPv version 4. And since I just did Active Directory, I need to now authorize my DHCP server. So if I authorize it and then hit F5, I can see that they're green. So we're authorized to handle IP addresses through DHCP. The next thing I'm gonna make sure if we're doing WDS, we're gonna have large files. These large files are gonna be stored on a um, hard drive of the server that's gonna be able to store them. And if we take a look at my hard drive, I only have one 40 gig partition. So um, that's this partition right here, C drive. If I minimize this, we can see that it is a 39 or 40 gig hard drive, we need to add another hard drive. So we need to shut the server down and plug in a new hard drive. And we're going to shut it off. And I'm doing this in VMware so we can easily, quickly install a new hard drive. So I go to hard disks and I'm going to create a new hard disk and we're gonna set this to be probably 100 gigs. So we have plenty of disk space. We're done, we get that out of the way and we can start the server back up. Okay, I'm gonna log back into my server. And I'm gonna say, don't show this again. I'm gonna open up server manager and I'm gonna add the WDS role because I have these three roles. I'm gonna now add WDS, Windows Deployment Services. And this is gonna be both a deployment and transport server. And hit install, it's gonna go through the installation. And I click close. Now that I have WDS installed, I expand it. And this is not configured, so I need to configure my server now. So I'm gonna right click on this and configure server. But before I do that, I need to make sure that my second disk that I installed is ready to go and ready to be used because during the configuration of WDS, it's going to require a location to store all the images and the boot files. 
So I'm clicking on disk management and as you can see, I have my new 100 gigabyte disk. I'm gonna right click on this. And I have to initialize it first. And then I will be able to create a new simple volume. Sign a driver layer E. And we'll call this WDS data. And we'll do a quick format. And just for the sake of having a, all the features available to us, we're going to convert that to a dynamic disk. What the heck, we'll do disk one as well. There we go, so now they're all dynamic disks. Now I can go back to my WDS, right click on my server, and configure it. Here's the location. This is the partition must be an NTFS partition, it should not be on the system partition. So it defaults, of course, to the system partition. So we're going to change that to drive letter E because that's the new disk that I just created. And this server is running DHCP, so we want to check the, both of these options to add the DHCP option 60 to our DHCP server. Uh, this wizard will take care of this for us. Otherwise, if a DHCP server was running on another physical server somewhere else, we'd have to manually add that option and point it to the IP address of this WDS server now. For this option, since we're going to be in an organization and for the sake of this lab, we're going to respond to all client computers, any computer that boots up. And uh, typically, if this were an environment where you didn't know who was plugged into your network, you might want to respond only to known clients. Then you'd have to add each client manually. Um, it lists them, I think, by MAC address in order to be able to have them boot to this WDS server. All right, so one of the first things you do is add an image to server. You got a couple different images. You can add a boot image or you can add an install image. And what this is going to do is install both. Uh, I want to install a Windows 7 image. So I'm going to pull that image and that boot image from the Windows 7 DVD, the install DVD that um, I purchased. So since this is a virtual machine, I'm going to choose my CD-ROM and I'm going to choose a disk image. I was, or I did when I installed this, use the Windows 2008 server disk. I'm now going to change that to use the Windows 7 um, ISO file. So here I have a bunch of ISO files, and I'm going to choose the Windows 7 Enterprise 64 bit uh, DVD install DVD and hit open. And now it pops up and says, well, you have a new disk installed on your uh, CD drive, drive letter D. So I'm going to just close this, ignore it, and then hit finish. And then it's asking me for a new image file path. So I need to browse to that DVD, and that's on my D drive. And they are located in the sources folder. All I need to do is hit OK. And then next, and it will find both the boot and the install image. And as, as it's noted right here. And a default image group has to be created, so I just leave it image group one. You can name it something else that might pertain to whatever you want to do. Hit next. And identifying it's going to pull it from the images. It's going to pull an install image, one of those, and it's going to pull a boot image. Just before I hit continue, I want to show you what they're looking at. If we take a look at, on the D drive under sources, there's two files, the install WIM file right here, and this is for installing Windows 7 from a server. So it's going to pull this install file, and then the boot WIM file, which is a lot smaller because this is just essentially the Windows, um, the Windows uh, pre-execution or the small Windows operating system file. So there's the boot WIM file. So that's what it's pulling here, the install file and the boot file. Hit next. And now it's copying those off the ISO file or off my CD and onto the hard drive. 
So if I take a look at what's happening now, if I take a look at my E, I have the remote install. I can see images is empty right now. Food has some stuff. So files, it should, this should start populating with uh, files. Let's go back here and see. So it's still copying. We'll uh, pause the video and then come back once it's done copying files. Okay, now that my task is completed, it copied all the images, I hit finish. And if I take a look on my E drive, my new large disk, I see the new image group one is created. And then there's my install WIM file, which is a nice small file. And then here is the larger file, which is all of the install uh, files that are needed in order for Windows to be installed on a computer. And then the boot WIM file is right here. It's a pretty small file that I copied over. So a couple settings I recommend changing is if we right click on this and select properties, we can go and browse through this. This is the option where you could change it if you want to later to respond only to known client computers. So this is the Pixie response. And Pixie is the pre-execution environment and that is what the Intel uh, network cards used to boot over the network. And this is just client naming, you can manage that. This boot tab underneath the properties of our server is require user to press the F12 key to continue. Uh, since we're in a virtual environment, it makes it kind of hard to quickly click inside of the virtual window and hit the F12 key. So um, you can continue the Pixie boot unless the user presses the escape key. We could do that option. Uh, same thing, we can do that for unknown clients as well. Um, and uh, you can always switch that back once you have your environment set up. So those are the only settings that you want to make change to. So we hit OK to that. And now I created a whole new virtual machine and it's just a blank virtual machine. Um, I'm gonna switch over to it and show you how we boot that up and it will actually load the files from my server. Um, want a quick peek at my DHCP server settings and show you the additional server, the additional server or scope option that it added um, for the Pixie, the option 60. So here's the option 60 and identify the Pixie client. And then I'm not sure if they added any to the scope client no, nope, so we should be okay there. So I'm going to now switch over to my workstation and boot it up. So I'm gonna hit start here. And you should see it's gonna boot up over the network, get an IP address, and now it's gonna load the WDS and it's copying the file from my server, 172.20.1.1. So this file is loading the operating system now from my server. Okay, now my workstation boot up and it's taking me through and I have to log in here with my domain name slash administrator account. So you have to put your domain name in there and it shows the Windows 7 install. So if I were to hit next, it would show me that now I can install a whole new operating system on this computer. So I'm formatting everything. I have unallocated 40 gigabyte drive. Hit new and apply. And it will now install Windows 7 onto this computer just like as if I were to install from CD. There are a lot of other options to automatically install Windows 7 without having to click next, next, next and choose options, but um, that's not gonna be shown in this video. So we're gonna shut this computer down and we'll worry about that install later. 